Benchmark, the voice of business. Presented by LMD. On this edition of Benchmark, we are turning the spotlight on the telecom industry and here to discuss a range of issues is Tirukumar Nadarasa, the CEO of Hutchison Telecommunications, Lanka. Then, LMD columnist Hasita Premaratna provides some insights into the Colombo boss and investor sentiment. And economist Leshal Dimer winds up the show with his take on Sri Lanka's macro outlook. That's the lineup for Benchmark. Hello and welcome to yet another edition of Benchmark. I'm Savitri Rodrigo. In the hot seat today is the CEO of Hutchison Telecommunication Lanka, Tirukuma Natarasa. And our focus today is the telecom industry. He is going to be looking at the key challenges facing the industry and also some of the global trends amidst a host of other issues we will be discussing. Thiru, welcome to the show and so glad to have you on Benchmark. Thank you for inviting me. Just as a background to what we are going to be discussing today, uh, what do you, how do you see the telecom industry at present? I think the telecom industry um, over the last 20 years has evolved very successfully. Um, today you have uh, a total of five mobile operators and all these five operators have got major international <coughs> telecom partners uh, with them. So that's a good sign of confidence that in, in Sri Lanka that, uh, you know, that bodes well. And as a result, over the last 20 years, I think uh, the industry has delivered uh, in, in terms of providing national coverage. Uh, across the whole country for everyone on 3G, 2G and also we've also delivered in terms of delivering the most affordable uh, tariffs probably in the world. So in, in these aspects I think the industry has uh, done very well and uh, is, I think we're now poised for the next phase of our growth and development. So how satisfied are you with the level of telecom regulation in the country? Um, I, I, I've been involved in the industry here for the last 15-20 years on and off um, and I, you know, I think the telecom, re telecom regulator and the regulatory, in the regulatory policy has been very positive um, and has been a key factor to the success of the industries to date. You know, the, um, regulators can take two approaches. They can take a very heavy-handed approach and regulate and control, normally in monopolistic situations, or they can have, take a light, a light touch approach. I think um, in, the, his, in, in the past, the uh, telecom regulators here have taken a light approach. They've allowed the industry to grow and to evolve. They've set minimum kind of coverage requirements, but they've not been very heavy handed. So this allowed the industry to flourish in a really in a private sector environment. And today it's a success today. We are one of the most advanced and developed telecom economies in, in Asia, in, in, in the region. And that's a result also of the uh, long sighted views of the telecom regulator. Now, the TRC uh, is looking to promote the sustained development of the telecommunication industry by shaping the regulatory process, also by protecting public interest, and also uh, by being responsive to challenges in this increasingly competitive market. Do you think they're doing that? Um, it, it is. I think it's, it's aware. I think it's aware of the, uh, the the rapid changes that are that are happening in the industry. Um, I. You know, I firmly believe that this is, this is something that has to be kind of uh, addressed and sorted out by, by the industry itself. I, you know, I, I think um, the regulator himself nowadays has less, less influence in, in these circumstances. Uh, when you have the, the likes of Google or Facebook, uh, Viber coming in and, uh, and offering uh, services, this is a, glo a global phenomenon that is sometimes beyond the purview of, of, of a local regulator. And I think it's up to the industry themselves to sort, sort it out and figure out how to move forward in this new environment. So speaking of intense competition, do you think the field is, uh, there's a level playing field and do you think the competition is healthy at this point? Uh, I think it's, it's, it's quite a healthy level of competition. We have five uh, mobile operators uh, you know, competing against each other. Um, you know, in, in most countries around the world, uh, it's a similar situation. You know, you have minimum three, four, five, six operators. So it's not unusual what we have today here. And as I said earlier, it, you know, the, the, you can see the results of this competition. Today, you know, uh, people have got coverage around the country. They got good quality 3G coverage. They got affordable tariffs. These are all results of competition. And uh, as such, 
I believe the competition is, is, is appropriate um, uh, for, for the market here. So experts argue that Sri Lanka really needs to look at new strategies when it comes to dealing with this intense competition. What do you think? Um, the, the industry, you know, the telecom industry is evolving and yes, we all have to look at new strategies, new technologies and, and adapt. I think um, uh, six months ago, one year ago, there was a discussion about uh, bringing in the Google loon balloon uh, to the country. These are, uh, you know, positive uh, approaches that they should be looked at to further develop uh, Sri Lanka as a hub of telecoms. And um, I think uh, we all should, you know, participate and evolve accordingly. Earlier this year, Fitch Ratings noted that some industry consolidation is likely with the ongoing intense competition, especially in the mobile sector. Um, are we likely to witness industry consolidation, you think? Uh, it, it is, I mean, yeah, there's, there's been a lot of speculation and I think it's, it is a likelihood. Um, but what I'm saying is that, uh, you know, this is not a, uh, a unique thing to telecom industry. I think consolidation uh, happens in all industries as industry evolves, technology changes come through. Um, so this is a natural thing that happens. And uh, I expect that same thing to be happening here in the industry as well. Um, you know, we are now moving into, into the 3G and 4G world of data, internet connectivity. So, you know, it's up to companies to evolve and adapt. And, uh, you know, if some are not able to adapt, then you will have consolidation, you know. So it, it is highly likely and um, it's, it should be expected as, as in any industry. Thiru, how are operators coming to terms with the tax structure and also in ensuring profitability for yourselves? Yes, this is a, a quite a difficult situation we're in today. I think. Um, on one hand, we appreciate uh, the, the, the government's situation today, uh, that they have to address certain financial uh, issues uh, for the country, and as such, they're compelled to uh, you know, uh, increase tax rates uh, to help manage situation. Now, we understand that you know, this is a kind of a, would be a short-term measure, um, and we hope that it will be a short-term measure, because uh, you know, today you have a tax rate of 49% for mobile telecom voice services which I think is, is quite high and uh, it's, it's quite a burden for the telecom consumer and uh, may not be sustainable in the long term. Also from an industry perspective, when half your revenue is, uh, is being taxed, that leaves uh, less for future investments. And we have a lot of investments coming up in 4G, in 5G that needs funds. And uh, you know, in the longer term, medium to longer term, we hope that the tax rates would be adjusted back to previous levels uh, once we are over this financial situation. There was some speculation that with this tax structure coming into being that consumers will curb usage. Has that happened? Yes. I think uh, the, the new tax structure was imposed at the beginning of this year and uh, we, have we have seen you know, a certain uh, decline in usage. It's natural as uh, you know, um, you know, a lot of people's uh, po pockets are limited and they have to make choices. Uh, between various products and services. So there has been a decline in, in usage, which we've also had to absorb and, and manage. So Thiru, we'll be discussing more on the uh, challenges and trends as we go along in the program, but time for a commercial break. So we break for commercials now. On the other side, Thiru Kumar Natarasa discusses the local talent in the telecom industry, as well as some of the main challenges facing the industry. Stay with us. When we entered the industry in 1995, a new star was born as a fully owned subsidiary of People's Bank. For those seeking to grow their businesses, PLC provided the seed. We are not only Sri Lanka's number one leasing company, but also the largest non-banking financial institution. Welcome to a new dawn for the nation. Introducing People's Leasing and Finance, PLC.
LMD is making waves, airwaves. The next big thing from Sri Lanka's pioneering business journal, LMD Podcast, now online. Listen to our articles on the go at www.lmd.lk. Select, play, listen. It's that simple. We understand that savings provide for life's special moments. That's why we were the first bank to introduce an incentivized savings scheme, Patum Vimana. We changed how a nation felt about savings because we believe in banking beyond transactions. HNB, your partner in progress. Thank you for staying with us. We are discussing the telecom industry with the CEO of Hutchison Telecommunications, Lanka, Tirukuma Natarasa. Um, Thiru, when you do look at the um, industry in general, it's revolutionary, it's constantly disrupting, it's uh, constantly evolving, it's a very fast-paced industry and that means that someone out there is constantly innovating. Uh, who actually drives this innovate, innovation cap capabilities? Talent? It is. Um, you know, the telecom industry is, is, is an international industry. Um, so, um, so a lot of the, the development, uh, you know, runs ahead of us in, in Europe and in the West, um, and so we 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 see the trends happening globally, and these trends are then adapted, uh, you know, into the local context. Um, sometimes, you know, uh, th uh, these trends are maybe a bit too advanced at this stage for for Sri Lanka. So we have to wait for the right time to kind of introduce the technology such as 4G. Uh, they've had 4G in, in Europe for you know, many years now. Uh, it's only now that we're introducing 4G in Sri Lanka because the, the, the country has evolved to a situation where they need 4G. So we follow global trends and we adapt it to local, uh, to local requirements. So that's the key. So in this context, how do you rate our local talent? What are they doing? I think you know, there is there is a, 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 a significant pool of, of, of local educated, uh, illiterate uh, talent uh, available in, in, in Sri Lanka. Um, they, however, need to be trained and, and, and focused. And that's where you know, uh, people like Hutch will come in and help uh, you know, train them and bring them up to an international level uh, standard of performance. So, but the pool is, is here. I think, I think we, are, we are quite fortunate our, our our education system and uh, our private education system is, is generating enough enough graduates, school graduates, uh, to tap into. Uh, but we need to, you know, invest in, in a lot of training to, uh, you know, bring them into into a certain skill set. What are the main challenges facing the industry today, Thiru? There's a large number of uh, of challenges that we're facing today, which we all have to evolve. Um, as I mentioned earlier, you know, you have the the likes of Google and Facebook looking to enter the telecom industry. You have uh, OTT operators like Viber uh, and, uh, and Skype already taking away large chunks of the traditional telecom business. So it's a rapidly evolving you know, chaotic situation which uh, established uh, telecom operators have to adjust themselves and evolve and reposition themselves continuously. But I think, again, to that extent, very similar things are happening in, in a lot of other industries. Yeah, you can see what's happening in uh, Airbnb, revolutionizing the hotel industry, uh, the taxi service with Pick Me, and uh, you know, Uber is completely changing the taxi industry upside down. So this is a, uh, this is a change happening across many industries, including telecom, and all of us have to you know, evolve and adapt uh, in this new env in environment or perish. You know? The Asia-Pacific region drove global e-commerce up by 64% in 2016. Value-added services and a mobile e-commerce, are we adequately leveraging on that, especially here in Sri Lanka? I, I, I think so. I, I have a personal uh, uh, opinion how this should be done. I, I, you know, I personally believe that value services and e-commerce has to be developed here in partnership. Um, to be honest with you, I, I'm quite, you know, I've been in the industry for 30 years. Uh, we, we are an infrastructure provider. We build networks. We build mobile telecom towers, switches, and quite physical connectivity. So if you ask me what do I know about e-commerce or certain value services like ringtones, I'm not a music expert. So I, I acknowledge that. So the best way for us to develop such services is to find local as well as international partners 
to promote this. Here, I like to give a nod to dialogue and the development of Idea Mart. Idea Mart is a concept, market, a marketplace, e-commerce marketplace where local app developers can develop local apps and offer them for sale to Sri Lankan consumers. So we have, we have, we have supported this concept and we have joined the consortium. So today, Hutch uh, subscribers as well as Dallas subscribers can access these apps and, and the app developers can earn an income. Now, I don't have 10 app developers in my office thinking of developing apps. That's not the right way to approach this. We've got to facilitate and support the local app community out there who know better than us how to offer these services. And that's, I feel, the approach we should take both in value services and e-commerce is support and promote experts in those areas. And together we can develop a, a vibrant, vast e-commerce sector here in Sri Lanka. Sathiru, so, as a final question, what is your medium-term outlook for the telecom industry? I'm quite positive about the, the medium-term outlook. Um, I think, um, you know, the, uh, w the growth of smartphones in Sri Lanka, today uh, we only have 30% penetration of smartphones. So there's still a long way to go. So with smartphones, people are looking for data, internet connectivity. They want to access the world. There's a whole, whole lot of things they can do on, on, on the smartphone they couldn't do before on a feature phone. So oh, I, see, I see over the next three, four years a, a, a tremendous surge in demand uh, for data connectivity and internet connectivity. That's going to keep us quite busy, all five operators uh, you know, trying to cater to that demand. So in that respect, in the medium term, well, I think we're going to be quite busy serving this, uh, this, this huge demand. Thank you so much for joining us today. It's been most interesting. Thank you very much for coming. Thank you. So we have been chatting with Thirukumar Natarasa, the CEO of Hutchison Telecommunications Lanka on the telecom industry in general. On the other side, we have Anushan Selvaraja with more. Sri Lanka's number one leasing company is now the nation's largest and highest rated finance company with two international ratings. Let us move the nation as one with People's Leasing and Finance PLC. LMD is making waves, airwaves. The next big thing from Sri Lanka's pioneering business journal, LMD Podcasts, now online. Listen to our articles on the go at www.lmd.lk. Select, play, listen. It's that simple. Nearly 60% of all businesses in our country are SMEs. Some of our most growth-oriented financial solutions have been customized to serve this sector. That's why we have invested over 500 billion rupees to support the backbone of our economy. Because we believe in banking beyond transactions. HNB, your partner in progress. Welcome back to the show. I'm Anushin Selvaraja. Now for a closer look at the latest on the boards. Joining me is market analyst and LND columnist Hasita Premaratna. Welcome back, Hasita. Now, uh, just to start off with, the indices are down a bit marginally, but what are the sensitivities behind this? Yeah, if you look at the month of April, where we, where the all share price index almost picked up nine percent. Since then, in the last uh, three months, really, if you look at May, June, and in fact, uh, up to now in July, you've seen somewhat a stagnated uh, point where we saw about one percent improvement in the index during the month of uh, uh, May and June both. Uh, and as of now, this month, we've seen somewhat a stagnation so far. So I think uh, what's happening is that the the the, the market got re-rated from about 6,000 levels down to about 6,600, 6,700 level and now it's uh, hanging around there which is something we already expected at that time because we saw a sudden boost and a rush in April which pushed uh, the index almost 9% within a month. Uh, but having said that, I think what is key from here is to see how the corporate earnings are coming out and, and uh, how, how uh, some of these key counters uh, would perform and how that will impact on the overall market valuations because uh, what we've seen is that the foreigners have been significant active in the market almost contributing to 50% of the uh, market and you've seen up to June uh, we've uh, uh, hit a record high in the net foreign inflows to the country through the uh, stock market so this is this is a phenomenal achievement and I hope uh, it will be continue with the trend to the second half too but I think the key for that is the valuations and how the companies perform and how these corporate earnings would look like in the coming quarters so if they turn positive and continue to remain positive uh, I think the momentum will continue. So Hasita, what are the sectors or areas that are still contributing to keeping our boss on an even keel? Well, I mean, when you look at it from a uh, overall uh, 
the market point of view, we are seeing the bigger companies, especially the John Keels, uh, Commercial Bank, even CTC, some of the big counters where the activity is quite strong and, and some sort of a re-rating happening in, in those counters. Also, the banking sector has seen overall uh, better performance across the board uh, while the entire market moved. Uh, and then some of the construction-related stocks also have seen the pickup, obviously, with the wider uh, economy, seeing uh, betterment towards the construction side as well. Um, tourism is another sector which has seen uh, good results. There have been some uh, uh, positives and negatives in, in, in the tourism side, especially given that uh, uh, the current uh, scenario in the country when it comes to dengue-related uh, uh, issues, there is some concern, especially because travel uh, warnings have gone into several countries. Uh, to, to be aware when they come into Sri Lanka. Uh, so that has given some impact in my view and will have a further impact in the coming months as well. Uh, plus the floods uh, two months ago also did have impact because but predominantly the uh, floods were around south area so south uh, uh, southern tourism uh, is somewhat impacted. So I think overall when you look at it uh, uh, the tourism related uh, growth that one would have expected three months ago has been hampered by the, these two factors. Uh, and have some impact in terms of the overall uh, growth potential. But definitely it will still grow, there's no doubt about it. But whether it will grow to the level that we expected at the beginning of the year, maybe not. So that's where uh, there will be some uh, concerns in the in the valuation structures uh, that may come in. But overall, uh, what we're seeing is that uh, positive momentum will uh, continue. Finally, after how is the rupee faring and where do you see it going? Yeah, so rupee has seen a modest depreciation in the last few months. Of course, uh, there is a lot of hope uh, that uh, there will be more foreign funds that will come in with uh, in the form of FDIs for as few, for few projects that have been currently spoken about. So, while Port City is the only project that in a big scale that we are seeing uh, money coming in, there are a lot of apartments and other related projects are also seeing uh, money flowing in right now. In the meantime, there are two, three other big projects in the pipeline like the Hambantota deal which should go through and also foreign funded uh, highway projects which also should give uh, a stronger inflow into the into the currency framework as, as uh, FDI. So, so, I think FDIs would be key. Uh, but having said that, uh, uh, in, the, in, the, in the interim period until a major flow or improvement in the FDI is coming, the government has also been looking at uh, the sovereign bonds as well as, as uh, sovereign debt, uh, which, which uh, both will probably syndicated loan with, will pro probably be helpful to keep the momentum going. Uh, so today with the 150-253 range where the rupee is, but, but I think uh, uh, end of the year the expectation would be probably to, to see about 157-158, provided these projects will flow in the money as expected. So that's that's the key challenge and that's the big if that a lot of people are concerned about. Thank you very much for joining us, Hasita. Thank you. That was market analyst and LMD columnist Hasita Brahim Ratna. We'll be right back after a short commercial break. Stay tuned. When we entered the industry in 1995, a new star was born as a fully owned subsidiary of People's Bank. For those seeking to grow their businesses, PLC provided the seed. We are not only Sri Lanka's number one leasing company, but also the largest non-banking financial institution. Welcome to a new dawn for the nation. Introducing People's Leasing and Finance, PLC. LMD is making waves, airwaves. The next big thing from Sri Lanka's pioneering business journal, LMD Podcasts, now online. Listen to our articles on the go at www.lmd.lk. Select, play, listen. It's that simple. Sri Lanka's number one leasing company is now the nation's largest and highest rated finance company with two international ratings. Let us move the nation as one with People's Leasing and Finance PLC. Gami Pubudur, our microfinance offering makes it possible for the youth of this country 
who have a viable business plan but lack the funds to realize their dreams. We are committed to grassroots level entrepreneur development because we believe in banking beyond transactions. HNB, your partner in progress. Welcome back to the show, I'm Anushin Selvaraj and now we're going to take a little bit of an in-depth view into our economy and joining me is economist Deshal Dimel. Welcome back to the show Deshal, it's been quite a while. Thanks Anushin, it's uh, good to be back. Now, just to start off with, give us, uh, just give us an overview of, of the economy as you see it. Um, so the economy is, uh, it's, it's recovering, right? let's put it that way. Uh, the good news is that uh, very recently the IMF approved the second tranche of the EFF. Uh, which is, shows confidence in the progress that has been made in the reform agenda, particularly in terms of revenue mobilization. Now, the first half we saw fairly good growth in terms of uh, in terms of revenue revenue numbers between January and April, uh, and that has been as we as we have been discussing in the past as well the major constraint, uh, the the lack of uh, fiscal uh, fiscal discipline in uh, historically in Sri Lanka, and uh, the improvement in revenue has supported the process of fiscal consolidation. So that has certainly been a positive, um, and also on the monetary side as well, the central bank in March tightened uh, monetary policy, uh, which again brought uh, further um, a further hold on the uh, on credit growth uh, and potential widening of the balance of payments. Uh, so in terms of stability, things have been moving very much on the on the right track. On the flip side, of course, of that is the is what uh, the natural the natural result of tightening of uh, of macroeconomic conditions is the impact on growth. Now we've seen first quarter GDP growth coming down to 3.8%, which is quite a low figure. Uh, of course, compounded by the adverse weather conditions, uh, particularly the drought, and more recently with the impact of the floods as well. So the major challenge that we will see in the Sri Lankan economy going forward uh, is how uh, how the growth momentum can be uh, brought back up to a more satisfactory level, uh, so that we can then see the benefits of the the stability that has been increasing in the last uh, 12 months or so. Recently, the BBC did a story on Sri Lanka, and the title was Sri Lanka: A Country Trapped in Debt, considering that 95% of our uh, government revenue goes back into debt repayment and our debt is something like 64 billion. Uh, what are your thoughts on this? Right. So the, the the debt burden is certainly one of the biggest constraints and the biggest uh, challenges that Sri Lanka faces in terms of macroeconomic management. Uh, and it's not, a, it's, not a, it's not something that you can fix overnight. It's a long-term structural change that needs to be done. It requires both a significant adjustment on the revenue side and also adjustment on the expenditure side. Now, the progress that has been made, I would say, in the last 12 months or so has been on the revenue side. Uh, but that also has been primarily in terms of increasing of indirect taxes, particularly through the adjustment of the, of the VAT. A number of trade taxes and other indirect taxes have been increased. Um, <clears throat> whereas a more sustainable way of going about that is to uh, particularly target direct taxes, because right now we have about an 80% to 20% ratio of, of uh, indirect to direct taxes. That ratio should shift towards a 60-40 ratio. Uh, and particularly focusing on getting more more of the informal economy into the formal economy. I think that is the key in order to make a more sustainable revenue base. Um, and then at the same time, it's also essential that we uh, that we manage our expenditure as well. Now, as you quite rightly said, a significant portion of uh, government expenditure goes into interest payments, which is difficult, which is a fairly sticky figure, which is not something that there's a great deal of control over. Uh, but we do have control over uh, what we pay, what the government pays for in terms of uh, expenditure on its transfers and expenditure on, uh, on, on capex. So that needs to be managed very carefully. Uh, so to ensure that whatever expenditure that takes place is in the priority areas and is in areas that, that results in, in strong returns and not, uh, and not investment in areas that do not create uh, meaningful returns. So that is the, the process of fiscal consolidation has, is, an, is, I would say, the, the essential part of tackling this uh, debt constraint that we have so that A, we don't add to our debt burden uh, and B, the, then the bigger challenge is how do we start creating, uh, generating economic growth and generation of, uh, particularly of uh, external external revenue in terms of export earnings, in terms of remittances, tourism and so on, in order to be able to create the, the, the cash flows to be able to repay this debt. So it's a gradual process. Uh, steps are being taken, I would say, in that uh, in the right direction. But it's a long journey ahead, and it requires discipline on all fronts. So, Deshal, have we actually learned our lessons, and are, are we correcting our path? So, I would say that in the last 12 months, we have been correcting our path. But that's also a lot to do with the fact that the IMF has an agreement with us, and historically, Sri Lanka has had several previous agreements with the IMF, where we have again gone through this uh, process of stabilization and recovery. 
Unfortunately, uh, previous occasions we've always, once the agreement is over, we tend to go back to our old bad habits. The story is different now, uh, Anushan, because Sri Lanka is now exposed more to global capital markets. So the, the, we are forced to be uh, to have more discipline because capital markets are not going to, you know, wave off your debt or uh, you know give you an extension to repay. Uh, so we have no choice but to uh, improve our discipline and to uh, to to have more more. Uh, more rationality in the way that we manage our fiscal position. Thank you very much for joining us, Deshal. Thank you, Anushan. Pleasure as always. That was Economist Deshal Timel. Thank you for watching Benchmark and we hope to see you again next time.